Have you ever walked out of the doctor's office or finished a check-in with your coach and been like, wait, did that actually make sense? If so, you're not alone. In the world of health, fitness, and performance, it kind of can feel like the Wild West sometimes. The truth is, what was once considered a very careful and safe domain to seek help and guidance and honestly, healthcare, is now flooded with cookie cutter protocols, questionable sales tactics, and practitioners, licensed and not, who may be operating outside of their scope. In this video, I'm going to be taking you through 10 mistakes that your doctor or your coach could be making that are seriously impeding your progress and could negatively impact your health. More importantly, I'm going to be giving you the critical questions and the red flags to look out for. That way you can feel more empowered, have more agency, and feel more informed when it comes to your health and your fitness goals. Mistake number one, prescribing a dose of TRT that is way too high. And yes, in my mind, this stands out as 20 milligrams a week, but Realistically, if you're someone who responds extremely well and is sensitive to androgens, you might find that 10 milligrams a week is also a little too aggressive, especially to start out at. Regardless of subjective feedback and symptomology, I still think it's safest to start at the lowest effective dose and then titrate up from there. This is going to be three and a half milligrams to five milligrams a week. For most people, they're going to find that this is plenty effective. However, if you do plan to titrate up and you need a little bit more, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And trust me, it is a lot easier to titrate up than it is down. Number two, blanketly prescribing estrogen modulators without knowing what your estradiol levels are. Now, this is very common in bodybuilding, and it's typically due to the belief that estradiol is impeding those crazy hard lines and the really crispiness that you want come show day. Now I can tell you that in a lot of cases, people who are getting close to show, they typically don't have very high levels to begin with. Given the fact that the state that you're in is likely already suppressing estrogen in itself. So before you look to something like DIM, calcium glucurate, Nolvidex, or even letrozole, Keep in mind that if you aren't actually producing enough estradiol and you throw something like this in, it's not really going to have the effect that you think it would. And realistically, if it is something that you do need because estradiol levels are sky high, well, this is something that you do want to confirm with lab work before putting it in place. Number three, prescribing Anivar without a definitive end date and in instances to even treat amenorrhea, perimenopause, or menopause. This is one I've sadly seen too many times, and it really bums me out because a lot of the individuals think that they're on HRT, and I can tell you that when using something like Anivar, it's actually going to have the opposite effect that HRT would. Anivar is going to have suppressive effects on your sex hormones, which realistically is potentially going to make you feel even worse. And yeah, while you're using Anivar, your gym performance might pick up, you might see an improvement in libido. But there is no such thing as a free ride, and we really have to weigh the risk of using Anivar indefinitely or using it to correct hormonal imbalances and decide whether or not the individual actually is okay with potentially occurring androgenic side effects. The reality is there's a lot of individuals who will enjoy using Anivar and they'll find that there's almost an immediate relief and feeling of improvement in their overall well-being. But we can't forget the fact that especially for female PED users using any anabolic, it does expose you to the risk of virilization. And realistically, we can't pinpoint exactly the dose or total lifetime exposure in which this is going to begin to occur. Number four, combining MK677 alongside a GLP-1. And I know some of you are probably like, what do those letters and numbers mean? Realistically, each drug is intended to create an effect, one intended to stimulate appetite, one to suppress appetite. And this is very much a real story where a client came to me who was working with a very big telehealth company. His goal was to lose body fat. And realistically, he had always struggled with binge eating, snacking, having too much of high calorie foods. However, when he started working with a telehealth company, he was essentially just handed over a price sheet and told that 
all of the supplements listed could potentially offer some benefit. What ended up happening is the wellness specialist that he was working with, who might I add, was making commission based on how many products he picked. They failed to inform him that each of these drugs actually had the opposite effect to one another, kind of nullifying each of their benefits. And realistically, for someone who struggles with adherence and overeating, I don't think there was any sense in ever recommending something that would stimulate appetite. Number five, using things that modulate estrogen to lower it while also being on estradiol therapy in the form of HRT. Listen, I get it. It can be so enticing, especially if you do experience PMS, you notice that extra water later in your cycle, and you just want to be rid of it. But Realistically, if estradiol is low, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put in something that's going to consistently lower it even further. And even more so if you're already using drugs to support raising your estradiol levels. This also falls in line with the previous mistake of working with a provider who doesn't really understand the mechanisms of these drugs. Number six, not establishing a hard ceiling and an upper threshold for serum testosterone levels for those who are on HRT. I've had so many clients come to me who their provider was simply good with them going off how they felt and whether or not they saw improvements in their gym performance, their sex drive, and their energy day to day. And trust me, I know how taxing and fatiguing it can be to be at such low testosterone levels, but we also have to respect the fact that testosterone does have a very high anabolic to androgenic ratio, meaning that even though we can measure it in serum levels, there is a point where too much can actually be harmful and can put you at risk for virilization. Now, the range that I like to stay in is under 100 nanograms per deciliter. I've had clients who have expressed that they simply feel better above this range. And realistically, in these instances, I've had to step away and say, listen, I can't supervise. I can't oversee this because it doesn't align with my ethical compass. And honestly, even though you might be OK with certain changes that seem less likely right now, eventually, if these were to start happening, it's hard to guarantee that you'll feel that way in five to 10 years when symptoms are exacerbated. Realistically, some of you guys watching this right now have a much higher free test than others. And all this means is that you are able to take advantage of a higher percentage of total circulating testosterone, which amazing. That seems like it's ideal, right? The only issue is if we were to titrate levels up past the point in which you can tolerate, even though levels might be under 100 nanograms per deciliter, this still could put you at risk for a higher conversion of DHT. This is where we want to be really careful and respect the fact that if you're experiencing excessive oily skin, acne, or darker facial hair growth, and even clitoral megaly, clitoral swelling, or vocal changes. These are all signs that we cannot ignore. We want to strike a balance where you feel better than you did prior to TRT. But simply being on TRT doesn't mean compromising and accepting androgenic activity. Even if it's not as high as others you know, there is a sweet spot for you, and I encourage you to find that. And if the dose that you're at right now doesn't result in symptoms being resolved, it could be worth exploring a higher dose. But I definitely recommend doing that conservatively and very carefully under the proper supervision. Number seven, starting TRT and being told that you don't have to follow up for anywhere from four to six months or unless something changes. The thing with TRT is that it is an anabolic steroid. And Realistically, even though we know that there's an established normal to normal high range in which we want to land at, we still need to ensure that the dose that you're taking is actually getting you there and not pushing you too high. It takes about five weeks for levels to truly stabilize. This is why I would recommend getting levels retested after starting TRT four to six weeks after beginning. Now on the flip side, be careful if you're working with a clinic or an organization that is locking you into a long-term agreement or contract because oftentimes there can be fine print where they are going to require you to then see them either bi-weekly, monthly, or bi-monthly. And oftentimes if the consumer doesn't need these follow-ups or lab work isn't actually indicated, 
then you can actually find yourself paying a lot more for a service that might not be appropriate for you. So if you're going to work with a clinic or you're going to work with a licensed medical professional, just be sure that it is clear and it is outlined what the requirements are in terms of retesting lab work and if you'll be expected to pay additional fees associated with this required follow-up. Number eight, using hormonal birth control as a catch-all solution for irregular bleeding, PMS, and cramps. Hormonal birth control is really good at what it's good at, which is preventing pregnancy. The thing is, the way that it does this is it actually causes the suppression of endogenous production of these hormones. There's also plenty of additional effects that probably would find interesting because there is a direct impact on your fitness goals. But when we look at hormonal birth control being used to create regularity in someone's period, or even in the case using it to prevent that period from coming, this really underscores and highlights the mismanagement from the provider's side in explaining that the epitome of female health is reproductive function. And the thing that's going to impact future fertility the most is compromising that ovulatory cycle. So if you're someone who is looking for a form of contraception and you are also experiencing irregularity in bleeding, PMS, or cramps, it is worth taking the extra step considering all the options that you have at play and really getting clear and understanding what is the catalyst that's causing these symptoms. So in the case that it is driven due to lifestyle factors, this may be something that doesn't actually require pharmacological intervention. Now, even for individuals watching this who are like, listen, I don't plan to have kids in the future. Periods are super annoying. Why wouldn't I opt for something that's going to cause them to at least pause for the moment? Realistically, you're giving up a lot. And oftentimes I find that providers don't go into detail on the suppressive effects that these synthetic hormones can have on your entire system, not just your reproductive organs. Number nine, very similar to number eight, marketing menstrual cycle cessation to almost upsell, framing it as a perk to hormonal birth control. I can tell you that I've had a lot of experiences with OBs who have insisted I would feel better and I needed to switch over to a hormonal IUD. I can say, fortunately, I have a very clear compass on what's important to me in terms of pregnancy prevention, and I don't see that hormonal birth control has a place in what my goals are now or in the future. Yet, there are a lot of individuals who are going to find themselves in the same position where they'll go into a provider's office try to get a clear understanding of the options they have and may even be upsold or have it framed to them in a way that, well, hey, if you start this hormonal combination pill or if you opt for an IUD that has synthetic hormones, you can actually go quite a bit of time without having a period. It's not to say that hormonal birth control doesn't have a place and there aren't individuals watching this that potentially are good candidates for hormonal birth control. However, there are a lot of us who are walking into the office kind of blind, trying to get the best medical expert advice and being swayed in a direction without really receiving all of the information. Realistically, it's not healthy to lose your period. It's not healthy to go years without it. And if this is something that we are self-selecting and opting into, there needs to be a really good reason why. Number 10, overlooking estradiol and progesterone lab timing relative to day one of your last menstrual cycle. I'll make this super clear. If you're getting labs done to assess hormonal status and you don't know when your last period was or when day one of your last period was, it's going to be really hard to interpret the labs. We know that these hormones fluctuate throughout the month and this is actually a good thing, but the values that we would see at the beginning of the follicular phase or even during your menstruation as opposed to during ovulation as opposed to mid to late luteal phase all vary. And if we're really trying to get a grasp on whether or not you're ovulating, there is a precise time in which we need to get these labs drawn. For most people who have a relatively normal cycle between 28 days to 32 days, this is going to be 7 to 10 days before your period. What we're trying to do is capture the second rise in estradiol alongside the rise in progesterone to confirm whether or not the period itself was ovulatory. 
like I said, just getting your period doesn't mean you're ovulating. But if we don't have that lab work to actually confirm whether or not progesterone is rising, we can't be certain whether or not things are working as well as they should or they could. So as you listen, think back on your own experiences. Were there any red flags that seem almost uncomfortably familiar? If so, hopefully you have a slew of questions to bring to either your provider or your coach. If you have any follow-up questions, thoughts, comments, leave them down below. As always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.